tonight? Is your soul at rest? Would you describe your soul as being at rest? I was thinking about this and I was thinking for myself, I, I, I think I can honestly say that most of my time, most of the time, my soul is at rest. And I was thinking about, you know, talking about how we can find rest for our souls. And, you know, typically I'd come up with a list of five ways to find rest for your soul, or seven ways to find rest for your soul, or ten ways to find rest for your soul. But I think for me in my own life, there's one thing in particular that if I do, my soul is at rest. Now, like, I keep a, for, a fairly full schedule. You know, I don't like to use the word busy. I don't like to say I'm a busy guy. Because I once heard of a priest from Trinidad, and he said no one should be busy because busy stands for burdened under Satan's yoke. So I guess I don't want to be busy, you know. But I keep a full schedule. And I've got a, you know, I've got a fair amount of responsibility, I guess. And, uh, but yet, again, most of the time there is a rest in my soul. A few scriptures uh, that I want to look at tonight. In Mark chapter 6, verse 30 to 32... Jesus sent the disciples out two by two to heal the sick, to cast out demons. He gave them his authority. And then the disciples, they come back. And it says, The apostles gathered together with Jesus and reported all they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. People were coming and going in great numbers, and they had no opportunity even to eat. So they went off in the boat by themselves to a deserted place. And the truth is, is that if, we, if we're listening to the Lord's voice in our lives, and when our lives get filled, when we're keeping a full schedule, we should hear the Lord on a regular basis saying to us, come away to a deserted place and rest a while. And it's not hard to find a deserted place to be with the Lord Jesus. As a matter of fact, every one of us should have a place in our life, maybe in our home or somewhere else, where we can be alone with Jesus every day. Do you have a place like that in your life? Is there a quiet place, a deserted place, a place of stillness that you go to every day to be alone with Jesus and to find rest in Him? You know, for me, I start my day every day in the little chapel here early in the morning and I spend an hour in the Lord's presence. And that's the one thing. If I start my day with an hour of prayer... I can go through the day with a kind of a, a, a restfulness, a peacefulness, a tra an inner tranquility. Even if things are kind of wild and crazy around me, if I start my day in the Lord's presence alone with Him, it's like there's a, a, a peace, a tranquility that uh, pretty much nothing can disturb. Another beautiful uh, scripture is Psalm 23. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I lack. In green pastures he, you let me graze, to safe waters you lead me. You restore my strength. Can you say that? Can you say, The Lord is my shepherd, there's nothing I lack. In green pastures you let me graze, to safe waters you lead me, you restore my strength. I think the Lord wants to do that in each one of our lives. He wants to bring us to a quiet place, and we should find that place every day. And again, like as we heard in the Gospel of Matthew, the Lord Jesus says, Come to me. Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened. And even those of you who are busy. Come to me and I will give you 
rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Again, a mark of a disciple of Jesus who is close to the heart of Jesus is interior peace, an inner tranquility. And we can't find that unless we're consistently going to be alone with Jesus in a deserted place, in a quiet place, in your in your prayer corner, your chapel, wherever that is. You know, the, the, the Psalm uh, 23, it's speaking of the Lord as a shepherd. And I remember reading a book a while ago. It was a very beautiful book. But anyways, it was a book written by a shepherd, a person who, who for many years worked as a shepherd in Africa. And he, you know, he, he bought sheep and for many years he raised them. And he was a true shepherd. He'd sleep out in the fields with them and all that type of thing. But anyways, he said one of the biggest challenges for a shepherd is finding water or properly hydrating your sheep. Especially if you live in a place where there's not a lot of water, which is typical for sheep because sheep need to be in drier areas because sheep are very prone to you know, parasites or all kinds of other things. So it's good to have them in a dry area, but the problem with a dry area is there's not a lot of water. And apparently, according to the author of this book, he says, and you have to be very careful what kind of water they drink. If they drink from muddy puddles or puddles that have, you know, excrement or whatever in them, the, the sheep aren't too smart. They'll drink just about anything. They'll get sick. And when you have six sheep, it's just very difficult. So you need to make sure that your sheep have enough water and it's got to be clean water. And what happens, he says, is if your sheep are thirsty all day, they're restless. They're restless, they're agitated, agitated, and it's very difficult. It's difficult for the sheep and it's difficult for the shepherd. But, he said, he says, few people know this. I didn't know this. He said that... If sheep eat dew-laden grass early in the morning, they don't need to drink any water. If they drink dew-laden grass that's just sopping wet with dew, they'll get enough hydration that you don't need to find them puddles of water or whatever. And he says it's the best water to give them because dew is pure, it's clean. You don't have to worry about disease and all that stuff. But he says it's only the shepherd who gets up early in the morning and leads his sheep to this dew-laden grass so they can eat, you know, this grass till the sun comes up and dries it out. It's only the shepherds who get up early to take their sheep to this dew-laden grass who have the luxury of having sheep that are well-fed and also well-hydrated. And he says, sheep that eat dew-laden grass early in the morning, by the time the sun evaporates to dew, the sheep's bellies are full of food, and they're full of water, they're well hydrated. And guess what they do all day after that? The sheep like to find a little shady spot. They'll sit down and they'll ruminate, you know. Well, <laughs> And, and just content, not a care in the world. And, and the shepherd says, there's nothing a shepherd loves more than in the heat of the day to see the sheep content, ruminating, you know, enjoying the day at peace. They're not restless. They're not sick. And he draws, the, the author draws a parallel with those people who get up early in the morning to pray. And as a matter of fact, the book of wisdom says God gave the Israelites manna early in the morning before the, the sun dried it out to show people that they should pray first thing in the morning, early in the morning. And you see, I think the Lord wants each one of us to start our day with a belly full of food and well hydrated so that we're not kind of anxious during the day. 
and restless and looking for bad water to satisfy us. It's just going to get us sick. Now, there are days, you know, there's been days where for out of laziness or negligence, I wouldn't start my day with a, uh, my holy hour. And boy, those days, it's, it's just categorically different. It's like my soul isn't at peace. It's not rest, restful. It's, there's a, a kind of a anxiety or a discontent. Why? Because the Lord wants us to get up early to eat from His Word, from His, you know, the banquet He provides for us in, in Scripture and our prayer time. And then we can ruminate on God's Word all day. The Lord wants us to do that, to just, you know, as I, another beautiful passage is Psalm 131. I'm going to read the whole psalm. Now don't worry, there's only three, three verses. <laughs> now this is beautiful. Yeah, pay attention. Lord, my heart is not proud, nor are my eyes haughty. I do not busy myself with great matters, with things too sublime for me. Rather, I have stilled my soul, hushed it like a weaned child. Like a weaned child on its mother's lap, so is my soul within me. Israel, hope in the Lord now and forever. You know, sometimes um, children, especially younger infants, they can be anxious, they can be you know, disturbed within, they can be sad. And sometimes all it takes to kind of restore the child's peace and contentment is for the mother to hold her child in her arms, maybe rock her, and this child's soul and heart is stilled. And I think so too in our, in our daily prayer time, the Lord wants to do that. He wants to hold us in His arms. You know, He wants to, to just still our souls and our hearts. And again, you know, I, I, you know, in all humility, I speak from experience. To start my day in the Lord's presence, in silence, in a deserted place. I have the luxury. I'm the only one in the chapel, you know. I'm alone with the Lord. He's present in the Blessed Sacrament. And again, for me, it's just, it's, it's a source of peace, of joy, of contentment, of tranquility. I feel like a sheep all day, just, you know, not a care in the world. Oh yeah, don't get me wrong. I mean, sometimes I have cares and all that, but... Uh, but again, I, 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 I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I know many of you, and I know many of you are listening to this, and you're saying, Amen, brother. You know, many of you, you know that experience. I know our founder, Father Bob Bedard, he said he was scared to start his day without an hour of prayer. Because he too, he saw the, the huge difference. When you start your day in the Lord's presence, alone with Him. He gives rest to our souls. It's a rest, even the challenges of the day, they can't take away. Simple, isn't it? Who wants that? Okay, so go to bed early tonight, and tomorrow morning, start your day in the Lord's presence. You know, read God's Word, and see what happens. See what happens. Uh, Norma says she's going to get up at 5. Anyone going to get up earlier than that? No, just joking. So may the Lord give rest to your souls. Do I hear amen? Amen. For an audio CD or video DVD, so I want to I want to speak about the virtue of humility this morning. A very beautiful virtue. I think it was St. Bernard of Clairvaux, he was once asked what are the three most important virtues and he said humility, humility and humility. Now sometimes people get the impression that Canadians are very humble people and I think part of the reason for that is that um, Canadians, we Canadians, we, we have some really strange mannerisms that are fairly well known. For example, it's a well known fact that Say, for example, you have a Canadian, he's just kind of standing here doing nothing, maybe, I don't know what, waiting for the bus or something, and someone comes up and by mistakes bumps into the Canadian. You know what the Canadian would automatically say? 
he wouldn't say, hey, watch out, or hey, what are you doing? The Canadian would say, oh, I'm sorry. Now, that doesn't make any sense. Like, he, didn't, he doesn't have anything to be sorry about. He was just kind of standing there, you know, minding his own business. Someone else bumped into him. I mean, that person should be sorry. But the Canadian says, oh, I'm sorry, you know. And so, again, it's kind of strange. I was, I was thinking about this yesterday afternoon. And then last night, I went out with some friends, and we were walking. And one of the, one of the kids bumped into me. And guess what I said? Oh, I'm sorry. I said, man, I'm still doing that, you know. So... <laughs> Uh, so I'm not, I'm not exactly sure if that's a sign of humility or not, but um, uh, now in Scripture, from the beginning to the end, there's this call to humble ourselves. There's this call to, 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 to humility. And one of the, the axioms or one of the, the, the sayings of Scripture that's in, in, in different ways um, foundational, we see it throughout Scripture, is the, the, the principle, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. But those who humble themselves will be exalted. This goes through Scripture like a thread. Again, that call to humility. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. But those who humble themselves will be exalted. So what I'd like to do is I'd just like to make a, just a few points about, about humility. It, it, there's a lot to, to, to speak about, but just, just a few points. Guess how many points I'm going to make this morning? Man, you know me well. Seven points. I like making seven points. I, I don't always make seven points. Sometimes I make five points. The odd time I'll make three points. Sometimes I'll even make ten points, but uh, my favorite is seven. So I want to make seven points about the virtue of humility. First of all, Humility, in the proper sense, c- properly understood, humility is not a weakness. Some people think humility I- is a weakness. They have a, a misunderstanding about the virtue of humility. You see, virtue by nature is a strength. The root, of, wor- root for the word virtue is the same as the root for the ver- word vertility. You know, what does vertility mean? Fertility means strength and, and, and manliness. So you could say the, the virtue of humility is like the strength or the manliness of humility. But again, a lot of us, we, 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 we look at humility kind of like a weakness. You know, we think of a, when we think of a, a little humble man, we think of a man who's shy, you know, who, who's, who, 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 won't, who can't assert himself, who might have low self-esteem, you know, who, who, you know, who, who doesn't... Uh, it's kind of boring or whatever. And that's, that's not the truth at all. We know, of course, that Jesus is the model par excellence of humility. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, we hear, For though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not, deem, he did not regard, regard equality with God something to be grasped, but rather he himself taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness and found human in appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Again, Jesus, the model par excellence of humility, the great, majestic, eternal king, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the alpha and the omega, humbles himself, becomes a slave, dies on the cross. And that's humility. Jesus was a humble man, but you better believe he was a strong man. When he went into the temple and they were selling things in the in the part of the temple that was supposed to be for the Gentiles, for the people of all nations to worship, man, he went in there and he cleaned house. He made himself a cord of whips and and he drove everyone else. Can you imagine? I mean, Jesus had backbone. He didn't care about what people thought, he didn't care about the leaders. He cleaned the place out. Like a man, but again, a humble man, a peaceful man, a good man, but a strong man, a virtuous man. And, and so again, humility is, is, is a strength. Again, a virtue is a strength. To have the virtue of humility is to be a strong person, and Jesus exemplified that. Second point is that humility, it's always founded on truth. They say one of the best definitions for humility, some of you are asking, well, what's humility? Some, one of the best definitions for humility comes from St. Teresa of Avila. 
She says, humility is living in the truth. And so many of us, we don't live in the truth. And again, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, a lack of a humility. Uh, humility, living in the truth, requires some, a person to be aware and to accept the truth. The truth about yourself, the truth about God, the truth about others. You know, we think, uh, you know, we think of the many people who have serious problems but don't see their problem or aren't willing to admit their problem. You know, you hear stories of, of reformed alcoholics and they say, you know, I was an, a severe alcoholic. It was obvious. But if someone, would ask, or someone would ask me or suggest, you know, you have a drinking problem, I'd get mad. I'd say, no, I don't. That's not true. Again, a blindness to the truth. Or a person who has a, a problem with anger, you know. Man, like, I think you got a problem with anger. No, I don't. It's like, okay, sorry. No, no, you don't, you know. <laughs> and again, there's a, there's a pride in this. There's a pride that blinds us. And humility is living in the truth. You know, what, what, what do I struggle with? What do you struggle with? Do you ever ask yourself that? Is that clear to you? Again, humility is an acceptance and awareness, living in the truth. Scripture says that the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. You want to be free? The first step is to see the truth about the reality of, uh, that you're in, your brokenness. Humility is to be able to say, I have many weaknesses, and with the grace of God, I'm working on them. Are you able to say that? A proud person isn't. A proud person isn't willing to admit their weakness, but a humble person is. Another saying is, the most powerful weapon to conquer the devil is humility. The most powerful weapon to conquer the devil is humility. To recognize the truth of my situation. Again, the, the, uh, the alcoholic, the drug addict, the sex addict, the, the, the gambling addict, the whatever, the person who struggles with anger, the shopaholic, whatever. The, the, the person who struggles will never be set free, will never to be able to overcome that demon if they're not willing to see that they have a problem. And that takes humility. To be blind to that problem, to deny that problem, is pride. And we know the devil fell through pride. In James chapter 4, verse 6, we hear that it says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And how many people, their life completely changes when they finally humble themselves before the Lord. When they finally humble themselves before the Lord. Again, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The third point is that humility requires us to know our God-given identity. This is very important. You know, some people think humility is kind of thinking lowly about yourself. I'm no good. I'm useless. You're like, that's not humility. I mean, if you are no good and useless, I guess that's the truth. But, that, but no, everyone's good, you know. We're all, we're all made in God's image, so we're all good. So to, to kind of, you know, um, think negatively of yourself, that's not humility. That's a lie. That's negativity. That's low self-esteem. That's not humility. It's a completely different thing. You know, as human beings, we have a complementary greatness and nothingness. And we need to recognize this. Our greatness lies in the fact, the truth, the reality, that we were made in God's image and likeness. We have a, a, an awesome identity, dignity, authority, and destiny. And we must know that. And again, from that should come a healthy self-esteem, a healthy confidence that I'm a child of God. I'm made in His image. He loves me. He sent His Son, Jesus, to die for me. This is, this is foundational. Do you, do you know that about yourself? Have you accepted your God-given identity and dignity? His love for you? This is foundational. You're wonderfully made. But again, along with this, is again, as human beings, there's this, we have a finiteness. In a, in a sense, a, a certain nothingness. There is only one person who can say ultimately, I am. And that's God Himself. 
who subsists in and of himself, this eternal being. Any life we have, anything we have, is a participation in God's life. It's, 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 it, it's being poured out to us. And so again, as human beings, we have a great dignity, a great, a great authority, a great destiny, but also a great dependence on God. And again, for us to, to not recognize this um, prevents us from living the truth about ourselves and experiencing the grace of God in our lives. Now along with this, again, our, our greatness, our absolute dependency on God, there's also the mystery of our fallen nature. That as human beings, we also have this mysterious fallen nature, this, this weakness, this inherent weakness. And we have to recognize that too. An, an inclination for sin, we need, we need help. We need God's help. There's a, another element of dependency on God. And at the same time, again, the other side of this is we're also redeemed in the blood of the Lamb. Set free, made new, given a new name. And so again, a humble person, uh, a person with the virtue of humility, understands these, these wonderful realities. I'm made by God in His image. I have a great dignity, uh, destiny, authority. But at the same time, I'm a, 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 along with this, I'm a finite being, completely dependent on God. I have a fallen nature, an inclination to sin, a brokenness, a woundedness. But at the same time, I'm redeemed in the blood of the land, made clean, made new, given a new name. And for us to, to understand this reality is essential. It's key if we wish to have the virtue of humility, which is so important. The fourth point along these lines is humility requires self-knowledge not just self-knowledge about kind of theoretically that yes i'm made in god's image and likeness but i'm a finite being that's kind of somewhat theoretical but 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 practically to know myself you know me mark goring you know you jay flunker you norma casey who are, each one of us individually to understand the mystery of my being my needs my weaknesses to have, to have personal self-knowledge. Do you know what your legitimate needs are? You know, uh, years ago when I first joined the seminary, I had this idea, yeah, I, I, don't need, I don't need other people. You know, I'm an autonomous, self-sufficient individual. I can do everything all by myself. Besides, I have the help of God. And I quickly discovered, no, like I need friendships. I need, I need people to, 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 to affirm me, to support me, to understand me. It's a legitimate need, and it takes a, a certain humility to recognize that. You know, how well do we understand ourselves as human beings, our weaknesses, our strengths, you know? Do we know the truth about our weaknesses, our needs? Again, it's foundational, it's essential. Self-knowledge. Self-knowledge, they say, is one of the foundations that the whole spiritual life is based on. I mean, if you're looking, through, if you're looking at, at, at life and your eyesight is bad, like Jesus said, you're not going to get anywhere. If there's a log in your eye and you're trying to take the splinter out of people's eyes, like, you're not going to get anywhere. So again, this, this self-knowledge is so essential in the spiritual life. And that's why a person of prayer should be a more humble person. If a person is a, truly a person of prayer, prayer should make a person humble because in prayer, as Scripture says, in God's light, we see light. The fifth point I'd like to make is that true humility leads to a positive projection. You know how we project on people? You know, we kind of see things a certain way and we project that on other people. Well, this can be a negative thing. You know, like you, you might feel bad about yourself. You might think you're a bad person. And because you feel bad about yourself, you think other people might think bad about the, uh, you too. And you think to yourself, well, they're probably bad people too. So, so you have a negativity towards people because you feel bad about yourself. You know, we, pro we project that on other people. But the Lord wants to turn this upside down and He wants us to see how good we are. He wants to, to see that we're made in his, in his image and likeness. How patient He is with us so that we can project that on others as well. Now, one, of the, one of the experiences in, when I had my conversion as a young person is I saw people differently. 
because I began to see myself differently. I began to see myself again as, as God's beloved child. Yes, a sinner, but yet loved by God, even in my sin. I began to see that God was patient with me, that he, 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 he was helping me in my weakness. And by God's grace, I was able to project this on others. I'd see other people doing bad things, making mistakes, and I was able to think, that's just like me. But God still loves me. He's still patient with me. He knows I'm a work in progress. And so this person, too, is worthy of love because this is a child of God. And again, a humble person sees people like that. Not in a judgmental way, not in a negative way, not in a critical way, but as God sees these people. We learn to love and accept ourselves, and that helps us to love and accept others. The sixth point about humility, and this is the one most people like the most, and it's a well-known saying, humility is attractive. A humble person, we're attracted to humble people. Again, Scripture speaks about this. We we heard this in in Sirach, Sirach chapter 3, verse 17. "My My son, conduct your affairs with humility. And you will be loved more than a giver of gifts. Can you imagine that? You know, we all love people who give us gifts. But if you're humble, you'll be loved even more. Why? Because humility is attractive. It goes on to say, humble yourself. Humble yourself the more, the greater you are. And you will find mercy in the sight of God. We know this. You know, sometimes they do studies. They study teenage boys and teenage girls. And they figure out, like, what... What does, a, what, does a t- what does a girl like in a boy? And one of the first things to, to come up always is something dealing with humility. Again, it might be kind of a misinterpretation, you know, guys who are shy and things like that. But ultimately, they're looking for a guy who's humble. And same thing, uh, guys are looking for girls who have a certain humility. I mean, who likes an arrogant person? You know, like who loves a person who's full of himself or whatever? Again, humility, true humility is very uh, attractive. A person who's humble is comfortable in his or her own skin. And again, that comes with humility. Do you accept yourself? Are you comfortable with who you are? A person who's comfortable with who they are, we like people like that. They're attractive. They're not boastful. They don't have a superiority complex. And finally, the last last thing I want to address, last point, is that humility, it needs to be applied in practical ways. Again, it's not just enough to have a whole bunch of theories and thoughts about humility. We need to apply ourselves in practical ways. Jesus spoke about this. When you go to a feast, don't take the higher seat. When you invite people to a party, don't just invite all the cool people. We need to have practical ways. I came up with a random list of practical things. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit that inspired it. One practical way we can be humble, or we can exercise humility, is to act, exaggerate smaller. I remember years ago, I was living with a priest, and he, he, he always surprised me, because when people would ask him a question, like say he put on a little retreat, they would say, someone would say, well, how many people went to your retreat? And he'd say, oh, maybe about 50 people. I'd think to myself, what do you mean 50 people? There was at least 75 there. But he would always exaggerate a little down. Our tendency, what's our tendency? How many people thought it was probably close to 100? I mean, 75 is close to 100, eh? That's our tendency. But this priest, he would always exaggerate a little down. And those of you who are fishermen, you struggle with this. Like, let me give you a demo. Now, you have to pay very close attention, okay? I'm going to give you a demo. So you go fishing, you catch a fish. Now, pay close attention. You catch a fish, and say it was this big. Let's get the camera straight on me here. So, okay, now pay attention. You, you catch a fish, and it was this big. You remember that? Okay. A week later, someone comes up to you and said, Hey, I heard he caught, caught a nice fish. How big was it? Now, it's hard to remember exactly. Do you remember how big I said Hard? Yeah, some of you are saying, yeah, it was that big. Yeah. <laughs> True fisherman. Well, it's hard to remember. Was it, was it, it was somewhere around there, right? Somewhere around there. So again, a humble person will say, I was about that big. A proud person will say, I was, it, was about, it was about that big, you know? <laughs> again, it's, it's, it's funny, but it's a little way we can exercise humility. Uh, second example, just showing interest in people. You know, we all know situations where a group of people is together. Maybe it's a 
an office staff or, you know, people traveling together. And there are some people, some of us, who are so kind of focused in on themselves that they'll spend a week with a group of people and you'll ask them, tell me something about any one of these people you've spent a week with, and they barely know their names. You know, you, there's a name for people like that. They're called me monsters. You know, at a conversation, all they talk about is themselves. Me, 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 I, you know, and, and all that kind of, th- kind of thing. And, and again, the, the, the Lord calls us to see people. You know, to remember their names, to love them. Now, I, I'll, I'll be the first one to admit, I'm not uh, a master at this. You know, I try, I honestly do. Um, but again, to, to show interest in people, to not always focus on ourselves. Also, too, we tend to defend and excuse ourselves, you know, so often. You know, your, your wife goes in the fridge and the juice container is empty again. And she says to you, you did it again. You always take all the juice and you put an empty container in the fridge. Now again, our tendency might be to come up with excuses or defend ourselves, but you should be able to look your wife in the face and say, Honey, I have nothing to say in my defense. I'm guilty. (laughs) You know, we, we, we excuse, we defend ourselves. We don't need to do that. Scripture also tells us to associate with the lowly. In Romans chapter 12, verse 16, Paul says, Have the same regard for one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Again, say we go to a a party, a social situation. We can give someone so much joy. We can make someone's day by just acknowledging them. You know, some people are lonely. Some people don't feel good about themselves. Some people are struggling. And again, if we go to a social, social situation and all we do is hang out with the fun people and the cool people, the people we like to be around, we, we're, we're preventing ourselves from the opportunity of helping someone, giving someone so much life. Anyways, I can go on with a long list, but uh, all of this to say is that God can do great things with the humble, but he can't do much with the proud. A humble person like the Blessed Virgin Mary, like Pope Francis, the Lord can do wonderful things through these people. Let's pray for the grace for us to be truly humble. Humble like Pope Francis, humble like our Blessed Mother, so that the Lord...